if we tur- turn to kind of humans, um, and so what have we seen in humans in terms of like protein restriction? So actually, you talked about uh, P- Professor Fontana's work. Uh, so are you are you working with humans in terms of the branch chain amino acids or isoleucine? Um, we've completed one small pilot study of branch amino acid restriction. Other groups in Europe have done something similar in different uh, subject populations. Um, all of them focused on restricting branch amino acids um, with essentially amino acid defined diets um, where you could specifically reduce the levels of BCAAs. And um, although our studies are, aren't fully analyzed yet, I'll say that the overall conclusion um, I think you can draw is that if you reduce branched amino acids sufficiently in, in a human, um, you at the very least for in a short-term study see some improvements in insulin sensitivity. But the effects of, ex- of restricting branched amino acids for longer periods are both from the metabolic standpoint as well as from the effects on frailty or health remain to, to be done in the future. The real thing is, I guess, frailty and, and sarcopenia, trying to understand uh, where that kind of line would be in terms of what the best protein input is. There's, there's definitely a line there. The other line I would say is focused on metabolic health. Um, and so one of the things that we have done and, and published is looking um, at humans in the general here in the state of Wisconsin with uh, some epidemiologists. We found that the level of dietary isoleucine in the diet is associated with BMI. And so that definitely suggests to us that relatively, you know, s- relatively small changes in branch amino acid or in this t- case isoleucine intake might have uh, some positive effects on uh, metabolic health. So are there any low BCAA foods? I mean, if we, were, if we were to aim for a diet where we would try and restrict our branch chain amino acids, what kind of proteins would work? You know, everyone's really interested in that. Um, the easiest thing to talk about is meat. So bodybuilders have known for a long time that if you want lots of branch chain amino acids, you should concentrate on beef and pork, and you should avoid turkey. Turkey and emu tend to be um, fairly low in branch chain amino acids, um, according to the USDA food database. Certainly low pr- foods that are diets that are more heavily based in plants tend to be lower in protein. And um, so that's definitely one um, possibility. Overall, individual plants seem to vary quite a lot. Um, Some squashes and broccoli and almonds are relatively low in branched amino acids, um, but there are also squashes and nuts that are are higher. So the easiest thing to to think about is turkey and emu, I suppose. Emu is not a common, (laughs) uh, not not a common meat in most places of the world, though. It is not. It's even relatively difficult to get here in Wisconsin, but uh, it is possible. There, there's a, a emu, emu seller at the farmer's market every weekend. So there's definitely some possibility. That is cool. Okay. How do you tell whether you have enough protein? Whether, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at your mouse, at your mice, kind of what biomarkers do you look for? And would it be possible for like a human to look at the at their biomarkers and say, well, you know, I haven't got enough protein apart from them. Maybe they're losing muscle mass. There may be people with specific medical conditions that have problems digesting protein that this might um, be an issue for, or people, you know, maybe with particular eating disorders Uh, said, I mean, the vast majority of people are eating enough protein, which by which I mean, you know, they're meeting the nutritional requirements that people have sort of established as the minimum for protein intake. I would say probably everyone in America and, and most of Europe is meeting those requirements with, without any issue. Now, people might want different levels of protein for muscle building or conversely, you know, if it turns out that low protein diets are better for aging related diseases and, and so on, they might want to reduce that. Um, and so, you know, I think that uh, finding a biomarker for that would be interesting. There are experiments that one can do in a mouse to um, sort of measure protein flux. Um, and certainly um, some of those can be done in humans as well, but they're not anything that can be done at home. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of do want more protein as we get older, but. Well, maybe. So let's think maybe. about calorie restriction for a moment, right? Okay. So 
calorie restriction has a lot of effects in a young animal that you would think that are bad. So calorie restriction, blows wound healing, decreases lean mass, decreases bone density, right? And so mm -hmm. if you looked at a young animal, you would say that a calorie restricted animal in those respects is unhealthy relative to an ad libitum fed control. Mm -hmm. But if you age that mouse out, the mice that are eating a normal diet that are not calorie restricted, they decline in function over time where the calorie restricted animal stays steady. And so as the ad libitum animal declines, the calorie restricted animal stays steady and eventually has better bone density, better wound healing, other better, a bit more lean mass, more functional mass, less frailty. And so could the same thing be true in a human? Maybe starting a low protein diet when you're young would have beneficial effects in old age. Maybe starting a low protein diet when you're old, that might be really bad, right? Maybe if you're already biologically old or you know subject to sarcopenia, maybe you need to take more protein than that. But maybe if you don't, cutting down your protein might actually preserve lean mass in the long term. So that's just sort of, you know, an analogy. And I think that the, the key point is there's a lot to be done and a lot to be studied. If, if we think that, you know, uh, like human, humans maybe can take less protein, can absorb less protein as we get older, and we need to kind of build, keep the muscle up. Could you like do something similar in a mouse so that you give it low protein when it's young and then as it gets older, then increase the, the protein and, and try and to like optimize their diet and see how old you could get them. I think that would be really interesting to do. And I think, you know, two major things would be the, that I sort of see as, you know, relevant would be first, um, you know, what you're saying, you know, what age would the best diet be? You know, would you want to switch over to a high protein diet when the mouse switches to the human equivalent of about 65 or at the very least stop a low protein diet? That's one possibility. Another possibility, of course, and I think a lot of people are really interested in this, is, you know, there's so many other interventions that are coming along that might be geroprotective, right? And how could those best be combined with diet? So one thing that a high protein diet does that you would think would be deleterious, right, is a high protein diet increases mTOR activity. And so some very recent work um, from Steve Simpson's lab looked at younger animals, but they found that rapamycin, which is an mTOR inhibitor, right, had the most metabolic effect in mice fed a high protein diet where they have high protein, high mTOR activity. And so if you were to take those to its sort of conclusion in a mouse study, at least, you would think that maybe rapamycin would have the biggest effect on lifespan in a high protein fed animal. Conversely, maybe a rapamycin and a low protein diet don't go well together because a low protein fed animal already has low mTOR activity, at least if they're a male. So there's a lot of things to be done, I think, in sort of thinking about how to best combine drug-based interventions with diet. So 